Hey everybody, what's up? Chad Wesley Smith here for Juggernaut Training Systems. Today I'm going to be talking to you about two important concepts for you to understand in regards to program design long-term training. And those ideas are uh, directed adaptation and adaptive resistance. These two ideas are, are in a lot of ways kind of two sides of the same coin um, and in a lot of ways work against each other but also you know, when you can make them work strategically with each other, that's when you're going to really get your best long-term training results. Uh, these are going to be heavily involved in your decision-making process in regards to the principle of specificity, uh, fatigue management, SRA, and the uh, principle of variation. Um, so we're going to get into to these, what they are, uh, and how they work together and against each other, and how they're going to imp impact your training decisions. So what is directed adaptation? Uh, it's a sub-principle of specificity, and it's, it's basically looking at logical sequencing of training towards a specific goal. Um, so you know whether we're, we're increasing volume for hypertrophic adaptations or increasing uh, intensity for strength adaptations or increasing specificity for technical adaptations, and it must occur in a timely manner. So doing it, you know, over the course of several weeks or several months, not, you know, once this week and once a month from now and, and another month after that, but it, it's, it has to have some dedicated time towards it. An example of this would be, you know, if your goal is to squat heavier for sets of five, you know, for directed adaptation, we'd want to be doing that once or twice a week, squatting for sets of five once or twice a week. You know, that is a very simple thing to understand. You want to get better at squatting sets of five, you squat for sets of five. If we were to introduce other goals to that, like maybe squatting also for sets of 15, so now instead of doing sets of five twice a week, you're doing sets of five once and sets of 15 uh, later in the week, you know, both, you could get better at both of those things, but neither of them will get as good as they could have been if all you were doing was directing your focus towards that singular goal. And the more goals you introduce to that, maybe, you know, fives, fifteens, and ones, uh, then again, all three of them could, could improve, but they will not improve as much as they potentially could have. So as we introduce those other goals, we can interfere with directed adaptation because you know, uh, the less time you train one of those singular goals, the quicker the qualities are going to decay. So even though you may make some improvement in fives because you didn't have that dedicated time focused on just training the fives, uh, you know, your ability, your, your best ability to squat those fives is going to go away rather quickly. You can learn more about this idea by watching our principle of specificity video as part of our scientific principles of strength training series or reading the book, scientific principles of strength training. All right, so that brings us to adaptive resistance, the other side of the coin of directed adaptation. Adaptive resistance, we want to introduce the, co the concept of positive and negative feedback loops. So a positive feedback loop is one in which the, the product uh, of the action produces more of the same. An example of this would be like uh, blood clotting. You know, you get a cut, there's a, a small blood clot that, that occurs to stop the, the bleeding there, and then more and more and more blood clotting happens to avoid that bleeding continuing. But adaptive resistance happens on a negative feedback loop in which uh, the, the product of the system means that you get less of what you had before. So when you're hungry and then you eat, you know, you, f you, you don't get hungrier and hungrier from eating more and more the way that when you have blood clotting, uh, some blood clotting occurs, more and more occurs because of it. But rather, a negative feedback loops means that as you eat, you get less and less hungry. And the way that that's going to result in training is the more and more you do a specific, you know, a specific task, the less and less profound the results are going to become because of it. So as we work with direct adaptation versus adaptive resistance, you know, we, we said in direct adaptation that you have to have sequential, strategic, timely direction towards this goal. You have to train the thing that you want to get better at it, and you have to do it over and over. But as we do it over and over, the result of it becomes diminished. So finding that sweet spot between direct adaptation and adaptive resistance is, is a bit of the art of coaching. To learn a little bit more about how to apply this idea of adaptive resistance and how you can understand it better, check out our principle of phase potentiation video. So how does direct adaptation and adaptive resistance uh, relate 
to strength training success and success in powerlifting. So there's four main categories that are going to be uh, affected by these two by these two concepts and where they're really going to come into play. First, that's going to be the development of technique. Also, hypertrophy. You know, as you do more and more volume of work, that volume is going to become less and less impactful on you growing muscle. Your neural strength production is is going to you know, benefit from direct adaptation, but then as you get too much of it, you're going to run into adaptive resistance. And finally, your connective tissue. If all you're doing is the same thing, you know, over and over and over, everyone's familiar with the concept of an overuse injury. That would be uh, the connective tissue's response to adaptive resistance. So in regards to the development of technique, we have the four stages of motor learning. We have unconscious incompetence, basically, you're bad at it and you don't even know how bad you are. You can't tell what you're doing. You have conscious incompetence that you know you have technical flaws and you're thinking about them and sometimes you fix them and sometimes you're not able to. Then you have uh, conscious competence where you're able to do things correctly but you're really having to think your way through every step. And then our, our goal would be unconscious competence where your technique has become you know automatic, uh, it is your default and you can shut your brain off, get under the bar and just move powerfully. Uh, and that's how you're going to be able to move the biggest weights. Technical learning tends to happen in this slow to rapid to slow process. So a beginner is going to have a hard time improving their technique because they don't have you know, the motor control and the understanding. And they're down in either that unconscious incompetence or conscious incompetence. But as you can make the shift, uh, as you become more advanced, uh, and make the shift towards conscious competence, their technique is able to improve very quickly because they can feel things that they're doing wrong uh, and make those corrections. But then as the athlete becomes very, very advanced, that technical progression is going to slow down once again because things are so fine-tuned. An example of this outside of the lifting world would be sprinters. You know, if, if you're familiar with track and field training, you've seen high-level sprinters train, they don't just sprint. They don't just do the most specific thing possible, but they, they kind of break down their technique into parts and address it with different drills, whether it's you know, A skip, B skip, C skip, different fast leg drills, running at different paces, maybe pulling sleds, running hills, uh, you know, tempo run ideas. They're doing things that allow them to address different aspects and different parts of their technique so they can improve those specific parts. Because if they're just sprinting, there's really no way for them at such a high velocity uh, to make the technical adjustments that they would need to to improve their sprinting technique. The same way uh, in that lifters are going to need to use different variations to improve aspects of their technique. And those variations could come through different exercises, through different loading strategies, tempos of the exercises. Uh, so that's what we want to talk about now. So finding that variation sweet spot, how much variation... Uh, you know, is enough to avoid adaptive resistance and allow you to keep making uh, the technical progress versus how much variation is too much to not allow you to develop the skill of, of the exercises and satisfy direct adaptation. That's sort of the magic that we're looking for. Uh, you can watch the principle of variation video and learn more about this. But the way that I will group things here is that you have your com competition exercise, you have its it's big, you know, variations of it. So, you know, we have the squat as our competition exercise, and then the, the variations would be, you know, front squat, high bar squat, uh, pause squat, changing tempos and changing loading strategies as well. So different set rep schemes. And then you have your smaller accessory work. So what we want to do is introduce variations that are specific enough to have a high transfer to the athlete's abilities and their technique but they have to be different enough to create some new neural pathways. This is something that we've, I've had to do with Marissa Enda's training now, and I think something we've really honed in on uh, for her bench press training. She had had very, very good bench press results, and then about uh, a month out from the 2016 Nationals, her bench just, it, it just started to look off, and we were doing a lot of benching. It's like, why is your technique getting worse from doing the most specific exercise. And we had definitely run into, uh, you know, adaptive resistance. Uh, so after sort of a poor bench, bench result there, less than she was capable of doing, we, I decided no benching for, you know, the next month or six weeks after, after the meet, only bench variations. Uh, sort of with the thought behind that being 
that she knew how to bench. She had good technique, uh, but we were we were just you know running into these same neural pathways through through adaptive resistance, so that introducing the the variations was going to allow you know a resensitizing to the technique, and we've stuck with that now after every meet. So she's having a shorter time of competition bench pressing uh, with this break, you know, four, six, eight weeks after the meet of little to no competition benching to resensitize. And that's produced, you know, just consistent improvements in the bench press where she had done, I believe, 87.5 at that meet and then went on after that doing 90, 92.5, 95, 95.5, 97.5. Uh, at the Arnold and then 97.5 at Worlds. So it was actually taking away the competition bench press and allowing some, some neural resensitizing time to that that helped her improve her technique. So how long should you keep the competition variations in? I would say that you wanna do the competition variation for eight to 16 weeks leading into competition. That it, do, it doesn't mean it has to be the only thing you do, but it should be the primary focus of your training. Uh, you'll need to be on the longer side of that, the less experienced you are. The more experienced you are, the more time you can take away from the competition technique because you're more skilled, you've done it more over the course of your training career, so you'll remember how to do it more quickly. Um, so eight to 16 weeks there. Uh, you wanna be complementing that with you know one to three different variations that are gonna address different deficiencies that you may have. Uh, those variations could be rotated every four to eight weeks. So maybe you're doing the competition bench press and then for a month you have close grip in with it and the next month wide grip and the next month spoto press. Uh, but again, it's every four to eight weeks. So they could be kept in, you know, if you're just gonna do competition bench for eight weeks going into a meet, you could have the same one or two or three variations along with that for the entire eight week training cycle. And then the next category of exercises, smaller stuff, you know, whether that's dumbbell flies, front raises, uh, overhead pressing variations, things that are a little bit less specific to the bench press, those could be changed out every month. You don't wanna change them too frequently, like every week, because then you'll violate direct adaptation, which supersedes uh, adaptive resistance. But, you know, to keep your training interesting and to make sure that we're staying healthy, you could change them every four weeks. Adaptive resistance is also gonna play a role in hypertrophy training. In hypertrophy training, as we look to overload volume, whether that's increasing every week or over the course of several mesocycles, that's what's gonna drive your adaptation. But as you're doing these exercises, not every muscle fiber is going to you know, receive the same amount of stimulus and, and fatigue from it. You know, Some things maybe tax the upper pec more rather than the, the lower pec, and that's gonna lead some muscles to become you know, fatigued and overreached potentially sooner than others. So with those being taxed to varying degrees, we can't just do the same exercise, you know, and, and continually load it more and more and more uh, and effectively grow the way that you're looking to. So what we need to do is introduce different exercises at slightly different angles uh, to avoid this issue. And, and that could be changing the exercise every mesocycle, or it could be introducing, you know, two exercises within the same mesocycle and keeping them for you know, several consecutive mesocycles. We don't wanna be just changing, changing, changing and not coming back to the same exercise at all as that's gonna, again, violate direct adaptation which supersedes the importance of adaptive resistance. But you could pair two exercises together like the wide grip bench and an incline bench as your primary exercises during a hypertrophy phase and maybe that lasts two to three, uh, potentially up to four months. Uh, I wouldn't go longer than four months with a hypertrophy. Uh, you're potentially going to run into some fatigue management issues, uh, some adaptive resistance issues, and you might just get really bored doing that. So neural strength production is also something where people often make a mistake of pushing it too long and running into adaptive resistance problems. You know, Max Montana, we call him Maximum Max Montana, I remember his name he used to be Steve, but then he did so many Max front squats they changed his name to Max. And he is, you know, the classic example of, of too much uh, directed adaptation towards neural force production. And, you know, Max did the Bulgarian system or a similar training to that with daily maximums, multiple daily maximums in the front squat, snatch, and clean and jerk for about 13 
consecutive years. And in his front squat, you know, right off the bat, he had a huge result, improving 52 kilos on an already pretty strong front squat in just six weeks. It then took him the remainder of the year, you know, another 45-ish weeks to improve five kilos. And then three years after that to improve another five, and five years after that to improve another five kilos. So that is, at its most extreme level, adaptive resistance to neural force production because that's the only quality they were training by just tr training the one rep max. But Chad, can I just change exercises and avoid this problem of adaptive resistance and just keep pushing my neural strength production week after week after month after month? Yes and no. You can diminish the adaptive resistance that will occur, but if that's all you're focused on is, is the neural strength adaptation, you're going to run into a couple of problems of direct adaptation and specificity. Um, so let's say you're changing exercise week after week and always maxing out whatever number max it is. Um, you know, you're, if you're not very, very advanced and probably on a lot of performance enhancing drugs as well, you're going to run into, uh, hypertrophy problems. You're going to start to lose muscle, uh, over, over some course of, of time. And that of course is going to limit, uh, ultimately how strong you can become. Uh, as you continue to change exercises as well, you're going to run into that same kind of problem we talked about with trying to squat for five rep maxes and 15 rep maxes. You might get better at all of them, but you'll never get as good at any of them as you potentially could. And we know what lifts are going to happen in a powerlifting meet. So those are the ones we need to make sure we're getting better at. So while yes, you can limit some adaptive resistance with it, uh, by changing exercises all the time, you might lose some hypertrophy and you're going to run into specificity problems and phase potentiation problems where you're not, you know, building one phase on the next to the ultimate highest peak possible, but rather you're improving, but rather than improving to up here for one day that matters, you're maybe just going to here for a more extended period of time. So make sure to check those videos out, principle of specificity and principle of phase potentiation. So I'd limit this type of training to at absolute maximum three months of neural force production, uh, you know, focus training, but more likely it's going to be one to two months. If you saw Max had this huge result in six weeks, you know, that's, that's going to tend to be a good time. And a lot of times you might want to err on a little bit shorter rather than a little bit too long. So most people will be one to two months. The biggest, strongest, uh, athletes might be able to do it for three months, uh, but other smaller athletes are going to run into uh, hypert uh, hypertrophic decay and stuff if it goes on too long. So while that type of training can be uh, have an extremely profound effect, like Max's 52 kilo PR in the front squat, you don't want to do it too long. So it's again all about balancing direct adaptation versus adaptive resistance. Finally, connective tissue can have a problem with adaptive resistance. If we're always training the same movements and that's occurring along the same you know, force lines, with that you'll run into overuse injuries. And that's a pretty commonly understood thing. If all you ever do are the same movements, you're just gonna get more and more beat up. So small changes to you know, the angle of exercise and everything is gonna help keep you healthier longer uh, and the principle of variation video and fatigue management videos talk about that concept more in depth. So to summarize how we can satisfy directed adaptation, which is the focused improvement of a specific quality versus adaptive resistance, which is the lessening adaptations that will occur the longer you train for one specific goal is you can keep the competition exercise in for eight to 16 weeks at a time. You want to have one to three variations that complement different weak points specific to you uh, that are done after that exercise. And th those can be rotated every four to eight weeks. And then finally, you can have smaller accessory movements that you rotate every month. That will allow you to develop enough skill in the exercises to satisfy direct adaptation without doing them too long where you run into big adaptive resistance problems. In doing that, you want to limit hypertrophy and strength phases to four months at the longest. Uh, peaking phases could be potentially as long as three months where you're really pushing for that neural strength production, but most likely more people will be in the one to two month range with the smaller you are and female athletes on the shorter end of things and bigger, stronger uh, male athletes and particularly if performance enhancing drugs are involved can push towards the longer end of things. All right, so that summarizes some ideas on directed adaptation versus adaptive resistance. 
Hopefully it gave you some good food for thought as you're designing programs, uh, as you're trying to optimize things for yourself and your athletes. If you like the video, you know, hit the thumbs up down below, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Thank you.